Hello and a warm welcome to everyone tuning into Growth Mindset Company. Today, we're venturing into the critical and often complex world of construction projects, focusing on two pivotal aspects that can significantly impact the success and smooth operation of such ventures, force majeure and insurance. Navigating the intricacies of these topics can be daunting, whether you're a project manager overseeing the next big infrastructure marvel, a legal professional specializing in construction law, or simply an enthusiast keen on understanding the safeguards behind the scenes of monumental projects. That's where we come in. In this detailed exploration, we'll dissect the essence of force majeure and insurance as outlined in the Fittick Yellow Book 1999, specifically through clauses 18.1, 18.2, and 18.3, along with a deep dive into Clause 19.1 and 19.4. With practical examples and scenarios, we aim to demystify these concepts, highlighting their importance in protecting projects from unforeseen events and ensuring financial stability. Our goal? To arm you with the knowledge and insights needed to navigate these challenges confidently ensuring you're well prepared to tackle any obstacles that may come your way in the realm of construction and project management. So, if you're ready to unlock the secrets of force majeure and insurance in construction projects, you're in the right place. Don't forget, your support through likes, subscriptions, and engaging in the comments helps us bring more content like this to you. Let's dive in and explore together how understanding these critical aspects can lead to more resilient and successful projects. Welcome to Growth Mindset Company. Force majeure is a term you might not hear every day, but it plays a crucial role in big projects like the Mumbai Ahmedabad high-speed rail project in India. Imagine you're building a giant, complex puzzle that spans hundreds of kilometers, involving not just the tracks but also sophisticated trains like the E5 Shinkansen, manufactured by the Hitachi Kawasaki Consortium in Japan. Now, what if something completely unexpected and beyond anyone's control happens? That's where force majeure comes into play. What is force majeure? In simple terms, force majeure refers to extraordinary events or circumstances that prevent someone from fulfilling their obligations. Think of it as a get-out-of-jail-free card in a contract when Mother Nature or other uncontrollable forces play havoc. The Fittick Yellow Book 1999, which is a set of rules for construction contracts, outlines force majeure under Clause 19.1 and includes events like natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes, or floods. For the Mumbai Ahmedabad high-speed rail project, this could mean a sudden, severe monsoon that floods the construction sites, making it impossible to work war or hostilities, even if there's no formal declaration of war, any hostilities that disrupt the project fall under this category. Imagine if, due to geopolitical tensions, the area around the Mumbai Ahmedabad high-speed rail project becomes unsafe for work, civil unrest, strikes, riots, or terrorism that can halt the project. If, for example, there's a large-scale strike that stops all transport, the workers might not be able to reach the site, or the delivery of crucial materials could be blocked. Nuclear hazards, this includes dangers from nuclear weapons or radioactive contamination, which, thankfully, is quite rare. But if it happens, it could severely impact the project's progress. Government action, sometimes, government or legal actions can unexpectedly affect the project. For instance, new laws or regulations could suddenly forbid the import of certain materials needed for the trains. How does it work in practice? Let's say a massive earthquake hits near the Mumbai Ahmedabad high-speed rail project site in India. It damages part of the constructed rail line and delays the project because the site needs to be made safe again before work can continue. Under the force majeure clause, the project team in India could notify their partners and stakeholders that they're facing a delay beyond their control. This means they won't be penalized for missing deadlines directly caused by the earthquake. Similarly, if the Hitachi Kawasaki Consortium in Japan faces a significant natural disaster that disrupts the manufacturing of the E5 Shinkansen trains, they could invoke the force majeure clause. This would acknowledge that the delay in delivering the trains to India is due to circumstances beyond their control, not because of poor planning or execution. Why is it important? Force majeure is crucial because it provides a fair way to deal with unexpected disasters. It helps manage risks in large projects by acknowledging that some things are beyond human control. For everyone involved in the Mumbai Ahmedabad high-speed rail project, understanding force majeure ensures that when the unexpected happens, there's a plan in place to address the challenges without unfairly penalizing any party.
In essence, force majeure is about fairness and flexibility in the face of the unpredictable, ensuring that projects like the Mumbai Ahmedabad high-speed rail can navigate the challenges of bringing such ambitious visions to life. Insurance in the context of large projects like the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail Project, is a crucial tool for managing risks and protecting against unforeseen losses. Let's break down the essence of clauses 18.1, 18.2, and 18.3 from the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999, using the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail Project as an example, to make the concept of insurance more understandable. Think of insurance in thems or projects like a safety net for both the people building the rail line and those commissioning it. Just like wearing helmets and safety gear protects workers on a construction site, insurance protects the project from financial losses due to accidents, damages, or unforeseen events. Clause 18.1 General Requirements for Insurances Clause 18.1 sets the foundation for the insurance framework within the contract. It designates the responsible party, either the contractor or the employer, for procuring insurance for different aspects of the project. The critical takeaway here is the emphasis on mutual agreement and approval of the insurance terms by both parties, ensuring that the coverage is comprehensive and tailored to the project's specific risks. For a project of Mumbai Ahmedabad high-speed rail magnitude, involving sophisticated technology like the E5 Shinkansen trains and extensive civil works, the insurance portfolio would be complex. The contractor, likely responsible for most of the insurance procurement, must secure policies that are not only approved by the employer but also aligned with the agreed terms before the contract signing. This might include, for example, securing a policy that covers the transit of the Shinkansen trains from Japan to India, ensuring that any damage during transport is covered. Imagine the contractor is tasked with ensuring the construction work itself. This means they need to find an insurance company approved by the employer to cover potential damages or losses during construction. If a severe storm damages part of the rail line under construction, the insurance would help cover the cost of repair, without financially overburdening the contractor or the employer. Clause 18.2 Insurance for Works and Contractors Equipment This clause specifically addresses the insurance for the physical works and the contractor's equipment. It mandates coverage for the full reinstatement cost of the works and replacement value of the equipment. This ensures that in the event of loss or damage, the project can be restored to its intended state without financial detriment to the contractor or the employer. Considering the high value of both the infrastructure being developed and the specialized equipment used in the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail Project, Clause 18.2 ensures that any physical damage to the rail tracks, stations, or construction machinery is financially covered. For instance, if an unexpected flood damages a partially constructed station, the insurance would cover the cost of demolition, debris removal, and reconstruction, minimizing the financial impact on the project budget. Let's say a piece of heavy machinery, essential for laying down tracks, is damaged in an accident on site. The insurance taken under Clause 18.2 would cover the cost of repairing or replacing this machinery, ensuring the project doesn't stall due to financial constraints. Clause 18.3 Insurance against injury to persons and damage to property This clause extends the insurance coverage to liabilities arising from injuries to persons and damage to third-party property due to the contractor's operations. It is a critical component that protects the project from claims related to accidents and ensures that victims are compensated without directly affecting the project's financial health. Given the project scale and its interaction with populated areas, the risk of accidents affecting workers, bystanders, or nearby properties is significant. Clause 18.3 ensures that if, for example, construction activity leads to an accident causing injury to a local resident or damage to adjacent buildings, the insurance will cover the compensation costs. This clause not only provides financial protection but also helps maintain the project's reputation and community relations. During construction, a passerby is accidentally injured near the construction site, or a nearby property is damaged due to construction activities. The insurance under Clause 18.3 would cover the medical costs for the injured person and the repair costs for the damaged property, protecting the contractor and the employer from direct financial liabilities. 
Expanding on Clause 18.1, general requirements for insurances from the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999, especially in the context of large infrastructure projects like the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail, offers a deeper insight into how insurance mechanisms are structured to protect the interests of all parties involved in such a significant undertaking. Key Components of Clause 18.1 Definition of insuring party, this clause clearly defines the insuring party as the entity, either the contractor or the employer, responsible for obtaining and maintaining the insurance policies required under the contract. This designation is crucial because it assigns responsibility for ensuring that the project is protected against various risks. Approval of insurers and terms, the clause mandates that the insurances must be affected with insurers and on terms approved by the employer. This provision ensures that the insurance coverage is not only adequate but also meets the quality and reliability standards expected by the employer. For a project like the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail, where the stakes are incredibly high, having insurers that are financially stable and terms that comprehensively cover the project's unique risks is vital. Consistency with agreed terms, it emphasizes that the insurance terms should be consistent with any terms agreed upon by both parties before the contract's letter of acceptance. This aspect ensures that any pre-contractual agreements or understandings regarding risk management and insurance coverage are honored and integrated into the formal contract documentation. Joint Insured Policy The clause also touches upon policies that indemnify joint insured, stipulating that coverage should apply separately to each insured as though a separate policy had been issued for each. This is particularly important in projects with multiple stakeholders, as it ensures that each party's interests are individually protected under the same policy without prejudice. Role of additional joint insured, it specifies the protocol for additional joint insured, including their rights and limitations regarding direct dealings with the insurer and receiving payments. This ensures clarity and order in managing insurance claims and payments, preventing conflicts or misunderstandings among the various parties covered by the policy. Currency of payments and use of insurance proceeds, the clause mandates that insurance payments be made in currencies required to rectify the loss or damage, and that such payments are to be used specifically for the rectification of the said loss or damage. This provision ensures that the financial resources provided by insurance are directly applied to recover from any insured event, facilitating the project's continuation or restoration. Documentation and compliance, it requires the insuring party to submit evidence of the insurance policies and their maintenance to the other party within specified periods. This transparency is crucial for building trust and ensuring that both parties are aware of the protections in place. Additionally, it mandates compliance with the insurance policy's conditions, emphasizing the importance of adhering to the agreed-upon risk management strategies. For the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail Project, Clause 18.1 ensures a robust framework for managing the diverse risks associated with constructing and operating a high-speed rail line. By clearly defining responsibilities for obtaining insurance, setting standards for the insurers and the terms of coverage, and establishing protocols for policy management and claim processing, the clause provides a solid foundation for financial risk management. This comprehensive approach to insurance not only protects the physical assets and personnel involved in the project but also safeguards the financial investments, ensuring that the project can withstand unforeseen challenges and proceed towards successful completion. Type of insurances For a high-profile and technologically advanced project like the Shinkansen train set, from its design and manufacturing stages to testing upon completion, a comprehensive insurance strategy is crucial to mitigate risks and protect the investment. Here's a breakdown of the types of insurances that should be considered at each stage. Design stage. Professional indemnity insurance. This covers liabilities arising from errors or omissions in the design of the Shinkansen train set. Given the complex engineering and safety standards required, this insurance is crucial to protect against claims related to design flaws. This type of insurance is crucial for protecting against liabilities arising from errors, omissions, or professional negligence in the design of the train set. Given the high standards of safety, efficiency, and performance expected from such an advanced rail system, ensuring that the design phase is backed by robust professional indemnity insurance is essential. Professional indemnity insurance provides a safety net for the designers, engineers, and any professionals involved in the conceptualization and planning of the Shinkansen train set by covering the costs of defending against claims of professional misconduct or negligence and any damages awarded. 
This insurance is particularly important in complex, high-value projects where the potential financial impact of design flaws can be significant, not only in terms of rectification costs but also in terms of project delays, reputational damage, and legal liabilities. Intellectual property insurance protects against infringement claims on patents, designs, or technology used in the Shinkansen train set, ensuring that the innovation behind its design is safeguarded. Manufacturing stage Product liability insurance As the train sets are being manufactured, this insurance covers damages or injuries caused by defects in the trains. It's essential for addressing claims from faults that could arise from manufacturing processes. Marine cargo insurance, if applicable. If components or materials are transported internationally, such as from suppliers to the manufacturing site, this insurance covers loss or damage during transit. Property insurance for manufacturing facilities protects the physical assets of the manufacturing plant, including machinery, tools, and the train sets themselves against risks like fire, theft, or natural disasters. Business interruption insurance covers the loss of income that the manufacturer might suffer due to a halt in production caused by an insured risk, ensuring financial stability during unexpected disruptions. Test on completion. Testing and commissioning insurance specifically covers risks associated with the testing phase of the Shinkansen train set. This includes damages to the train set or third-party properties and injuries to persons during testing activities. Transit insurance for moving the train set from the manufacturing site to the testing location or its final operational line, this insurance covers risks of damage or loss during transit. Third-party liability insurance protects against liabilities for damages or injuries to third parties during the testing phase, including accidents that could occur while the train set is being tested on tracks. Throughout all stages, cyber liability insurance, given the digital and connected nature of modern train systems like the Shinkansen, this insurance covers risks related to cyber threats, data breaches, or system hacks that could impact operational technology and safety systems. Environmental liability insurance covers claims for environmental damage that might occur at any stage, from manufacturing processes that could harm the environment to accidents during testing that result in pollution. Clause 18.2, Insurance for Works and Contractors Equipment within the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999 framework is pivotal for managing the risks associated with construction projects, such as the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail Project. This clause outlines the requirements for ensuring the physical works and the equipment used by the contractor during the construction phase. Let's delve deeper into its components and implications. Key Components Scope of coverage, this clause mandates the contractor to ensure the works, plant, materials, and contractor's documents against all risks of loss or damage. For a project like the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail, this would encompass the rail tracks, stations, signaling equipment, and even the Shinkansen train sets during their assembly or installation phase, as well as any documentation related to the construction. Full reinstatement cost. The insurance must cover the full reinstatement cost of the works and replacement value of the equipment. This ensures that in the event of damage or loss, the project can be restored to its intended state without financial detriment to the contractor or the employer. It includes costs for demolition, debris removal, and professional fees associated with the reconstruction. Duration of coverage The insurance should be effective from the start of the project until the issuance of the taking over certificate for the works. This period covers all phases of construction, ensuring continuous protection against risks until the project is formally handed over to the employer. Extension for liability Beyond the taking over certificate, the insurance must also cover the contractor's liability for loss or damage occurring before the taking over certificate was issued and for any damage caused by the contractor during any operations under the defects liability period. Joint names, the policy is typically required to be in the joint names of the employer and the contractor. This ensures that both parties have a direct right to claim from the insurers, facilitating a smoother claims process and providing mutual protection. Practical implications for the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail Project Comprehensive protection for the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail Project Clause 18.2 ensures that all physical aspects of the construction are protected against a wide range of risks, from natural disasters like floods or earthquakes to human-caused incidents like vandalism or theft. This comprehensive coverage is crucial for a project of this scale and complexity. Financial stability, by covering the full reinstatement cost, the clause safeguards the project's financial stability. 
For instance, if a significant portion of the rail infrastructure is damaged due to an unforeseen event, the insurance coverage ensures that the necessary funds are available to restore the project without imposing additional financial burdens on the contractor or the employer. Continuous coverage. The specified duration of coverage aligns with the project's critical milestones, from commencement to completion and beyond into the defects liability period. This continuous protection is essential for managing the evolving risks at different construction stages. Mutual interests. The requirement for joint names in the insurance policy underscores the mutual interests of the employer and the contractor in the project's success. It fosters a collaborative approach to risk management, ensuring that both parties are equally protected and have equitable rights in the insurance arrangement. Clause 18.2 in the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999 plays a fundamental role in the risk management strategy of construction projects, providing a structured approach to ensuring the works and equipment. For the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail Project, Adhering to this clause means ensuring that the monumental task of constructing a high-speed rail line is backed by a solid insurance foundation, mitigating risks and protecting the project's integrity from start to finish. Clause 18.3. Insurance against injury to persons and damage to property in the FIDIC Yellow Book, 1999, addresses the critical aspect of liability insurance within construction projects. This clause ensures that both the contractor and the employer are protected against claims arising from injuries to individuals or damage to property, not covered by the insurance for the works and contractor's equipment specified in Clause 18.2. Here's a deeper look into its components and implications, particularly in the context of a large-scale project like the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail MAHSR. Key Components Liability Coverage this clause mandates the insuring party, typically the contractor, to secure insurance that covers liability for any loss, damage, death or bodily injury that may occur to any property or person as a result of the contractor's performance of the contract. This coverage is crucial for addressing accidents or damages that could happen during the construction activities. Scope and Limits The insurance must cover liabilities up to a specified limit per occurrence, which is determined based on the potential risks and the scale of the project. This limit should be adequate to cover significant claims, ensuring that the contractor and the employer are not financially burdened by potential liabilities. Duration. The coverage should remain in effect until the issuance of the performance certificate, which marks the official completion of the project and the satisfactory fulfillment of the contractor's obligations, including addressing any defects. Joint names. Similar to Clause 18.2, the policies under Clause 18.3 are often required to be in the joint names of the contractor and the employer. This ensures that both parties are directly protected against claims and can engage with the insurance process. Practical Implications for the MAHSR Project Comprehensive Protection Against Liabilities For the MAHSR Project, this clause provides a safety net against the wide array of risks associated with constructing a high-speed rail line. For instance, if a construction crane accidentally damages a nearby building, or if a passerby is injured near the construction site, the liability insurance would cover the compensation costs, legal fees, and any other expenses arising from these incidents. Financial Security By setting a substantial limit per occurrence, the clause ensures that the project can handle large claims without jeopardizing its financial stability. This is particularly important for a project of the MAHSR's magnitude, where the scale of operations increases the likelihood of significant claims. Operational Continuity Ensuring that liability insurance is in place until the performance certificate is issued allows the project to proceed smoothly towards completion. It provides peace of mind to all stakeholders that potential legal and financial hurdles related to injuries or property damage will be managed effectively, without causing delays or additional costs. Collaborative Risk Management The requirement for joint names in the insurance policy fosters a collaborative approach to risk management between the contractor and the employer. It aligns their interests in minimizing risks and ensures that both parties are equally protected under the policy. Clause 18.3 in the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999 is essential for managing the liability risks associated with construction projects. For the MAHSR project, 
Adhering to this clause means safeguarding against the potential legal and financial impacts of accidents or damages that could occur during the project's life cycle. It underscores the importance of comprehensive risk management strategies that include liability insurance as a key component, ensuring the project's successful and uninterrupted completion. This flowchart illustrates the process outlined in Clause 19.4 of the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999 regarding the consequences of force majeure. Here's a detailed explanation of each step. Start. Notice of force majeure under 19.2, the process begins when the contractor gives notice of force majeure as required under sub-clause 19.2. Contractor prevented from obligations. This step acknowledges that the contractor is prevented from performing their obligations under the contract due to force majeure. Is completion delayed? This decision point checks if the force majeure event has delayed the completion of the project. If yes, the contractor is entitled to an extension of time for completion under subclause 8.4. If no, there is no entitlement to an extension of time. Does event fall under 19.1 IIV? This decision point assesses whether the force majeure event falls under the categories described in subclause 19.1 I to IV. If yes, and the event occurs in the country, the contractor is entitled to payment of any such cost incurred. If no, or the event does not occur in the country, there is no entitlement to payment of cost. Engineer proceeds under 3.5 to agree determine matters. Regardless of the outcomes in the previous steps, the engineer will proceed in accordance with sub-clause 3.5 to agree or determine the matters related to the extension of time and or payment of costs. End. Determination made. The process concludes when the engineer makes a determination regarding the extension of time and or payment of costs. This flow diagram visually represents the application of Clause 19.4 in the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999 and its interconnections with other relevant clauses. Here's a breakdown of the diagram. Clause 19.2 Notice of Force Majeure The process starts with the contractor providing notice of a force majeure event as required. This is a prerequisite for invoking Clause 19.4. Clause 19.4 Consequences of force majeure. This is the central clause, detailing the entitlements of the contractor in the event of force majeure, including extensions of time and payment of costs. Clause 8.4. Extension of time for completion. Clause 19.4 directly leads to the possibility of an extension of time for project completion, highlighting the procedural connection between experiencing force majeure and adjusting the project schedule. Clause 3.5. Engineers' Determinations The engineer's role in determining the outcomes of claims made under Clause 19.4 is crucial. This clause outlines the process for these determinations. Clause 20.1 Contractors' Claims This clause is linked to Clause 19.4 as it provides the procedural framework for the contractor to submit claims, including those arising from force majeure events. Project Schedule Adjustment Following the extension of time, the project schedule may be adjusted to reflect the new completion date. Resolution of Disputes Any disputes arising from the engineer's determinations or the application of Clause 19.4 may be resolved through the mechanisms provided in the contract. Claim Submission and Review This step involves the contractor submitting a claim for the extension of time and or costs, which is then reviewed. Claim Approval or Rejection the claim submitted under Clause 19.4 is either approved or rejected, leading to adjustments in the contract terms or compensation. This flowchart provides a structured approach to identifying force majeure events as defined under Clause 19.1 of the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999. The process is detailed as follows. Start. Identification of force majeure under 19.1 The process begins with the identification of an event or circumstance that might qualify as force majeure. Event beyond party's control. The first criterion checks if the event is beyond the control of the party affected by it. Party could not have provided against it. This step verifies whether the party could reasonably have anticipated and provided against the event before entering into the contract. Party could not have avoided, overcome it. It assesses whether, once the event occurred, the party could reasonably have avoided or overcome its effects. Not substantially attributable to other party. This ensures that the event is not significantly caused by the actions or omissions of the other contractual party. Meets criteria for force majeure? This decision point determines if the event meets all the above criteria to be considered force majeure. 
If yes, it proceeds to identify the specific category of force majeure events. If no, the event is not considered force majeure. Categories of force majeure events. This section categorizes events that may qualify as force majeure if they meet the initial criteria. War, hostilities, invasion, and similar events. Rebellion, terrorism, sabotage, revolution, civil war. Riot, commotion, disorder, strike, or lockout by persons other than the contractor's personnel. Munitions of war, explosive materials, ionizing radiation, or contamination by radioactivity, not attributable to the contractor's use of such substances. Natural catastrophes such as earthquakes, hurricanes, typhoons, or volcanic activity. End. Force majeure established. The process concludes with the establishment of an event as force majeure following the criteria set out in Clause 19.1. This flowchart systematically breaks down the complex criteria for force majeure into manageable steps, providing clarity on how such events are identified and categorized according to the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999. This flowchart outlines the insurance requirements as specified in Clause 18.2 of the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999, particularly in the context of force majeure events defined under Clause 19.1. Here's a step-by-step -step explanation. Start. Clause 18.2 Insurance Requirements. The process begins with the insurance obligations outlined in Clause 18.2, focusing on the works, plant, materials, and contractors' documents. Insurance of works, plant, materials, and documents. The insuring party must insure these items for not less than the full reinstatement cost, including costs of demolition, removal of debris, professional fees, and profit. Full reinstatement cost coverage. The coverage must encompass the full cost to reinstate the works, plant, materials, and documents to their condition before any damage or loss. Effective from evidence submission date to taking over certificate. The insurance should be effective from the date specified for evidence submission under subclause 18.1 until the taking over certificate for the works is issued. Maintenance of insurance until performance certificate. The insurance must be maintained to cover loss or damage for which the contractor is liable, occurring before the issue of the taking over certificate, and for any damage caused by the contractor during any operations, including those under Clause 11, defects liability. Insurance of contractor's equipment for full replacement value. The contractor's equipment must be insured for its full replacement value, including delivery to the site, effective while being transported to the site and until no longer required. Is it force majeure under 19.1? This decision point assesses whether a force majeure event, as defined in Clause 19.1, has occurred. If yes, proceed to review the insurance coverage in light of the force majeure event. If no, continue with the standard insurance obligations as outlined. Review insurance coverage in light of force majeure. In the case of force majeure, the insurance coverage may need to be reviewed and adjusted to ensure it remains adequate and compliant with the contract requirements. Adjust insurance coverage as necessary. Based on the review, adjustments to the insurance coverage may be necessary to adequately protect against the risks posed by the force majeure event. End. Ensure compliance with Clause 18.2 and related clauses. The process concludes with the insuring party ensuring that the insurance coverage complies with Clause 18.2 and is adjusted as necessary in the context of force majeure and related clauses. This flowchart provides a clear overview of the insurance requirements under Clause 18.2, emphasizing the need for comprehensive coverage that accounts for force majeure events and their potential impact on the project. The flowchart, Logical Process Flowchart for Force Majeure Claims, outlines the steps a project team should take when a force majeure event, a major, unforeseen event beyond anyone's control, impacts a construction project. This guide is designed to be accessible to a wide audience, explaining how to navigate these complex situations step by step. Understanding Force Majeure Events When an unexpected, significant event occurs, it's crucial to first identify what type of event it is. The events are broadly categorized into two types. Natural Catastrophes These are major natural disasters like earthquakes, hurricanes, or floods. Other Specified Events this category includes human-made events such as wars, acts of terrorism, civil unrest, etc. Assessing the impact. Regardless of the event type, the next step is to assess how this event affects the project. This could mean damage to the construction site, delays in the project timeline, or both. Where did the event occur? 
the location of the event plays a crucial role in determining the next steps. In the country, if the event occurs within the same country as the project, the team needs to consider both insurance claims and contractual claims under the project agreement. Outside the country, if the event happens in another country, such as where materials are being manufactured, the team must review the project's insurance policy and contract to decide on the best course of action. Dealing with insurance. If the event is covered by insurance, the team must determine whether the insurance policy fully covers the costs associated with the event. Fully covered by insurance. If all costs are covered, the team should claim these costs from the insurance company. Not fully covered by insurance. If the insurance does not cover all costs, or if there are additional uncovered costs, the team can make a claim under the project contract to cover these expenses. Direct impact on the project. For events occurring outside the project's country, it's important to assess whether the event directly impacts the project. If there is a direct impact, such as the destruction of materials meant for the project, the team must again consider insurance coverage. Direct impact fully covered by insurance. If insurance covers the direct impact costs, claim these costs from the insurance company. Direct impact not fully covered by insurance. If insurance does not fully cover the direct impact costs, the team can claim the additional costs under the project contract. In simple terms, when a big, unexpected event, like a natural disaster or an act of war, affects a construction project, the project team needs to figure out what happened, where it happened, and how it impacts the project. They then need to check if the project's insurance covers the damage or delays caused by this event. If insurance doesn't cover everything, the team might be able to claim the extra costs through the project's contract. The key is to understand the type of event, its location, and the coverage provided by insurance to navigate through these challenging situations effectively. Sequence of Actions in Force Majeure Events Sequence Diagram Explanation This sequence diagram visually represents the interactions between the contractor, employer, engineer, and insurance company following a force majeure event under the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999. Here's a detailed explanation of each step. Starting point. A big problem arises. Imagine a scenario where something big and unexpected happens, like a natural disaster or a war, that stops a construction project in its tracks. This is what we call a force majeure event. Contractor raises the alarm. The contractor, the person or company hired to do the construction work, quickly tells the employer, the person or company who hired them, about the problem. They explain how this big event is stopping them from doing their job. Employer passes the message along. After hearing about the issue, the employer informs the engineer. The engineer is like the project's referee, making sure everything goes according to plan. Engineer asks for more info. The engineer might need more details to understand how bad the situation is and how it affects the project. So, they ask the contractor for more information. Contractor provides details. The contractor gives all the requested details to the engineer, helping them assess the situation better. Engineer makes a decision. With all the information in hand, the engineer decides if the project's timeline needs to be extended or if extra money needs to be spent because of the unexpected event. Contractor informs employer about the decision. The contractor then tells the employer what the engineer decided regarding the project's timeline and costs. Employer talks to the insurance company. The employer notifies the insurance company about the force majeure event because it might affect the project's insurance coverage. Insurance company adjusts coverage. The insurance company looks into the event and decides if they need to change the insurance coverage to better protect the project. Employer confirms changes. The employer lets the contractor know about any changes to the project schedule or contract because of the engineer's decision and the insurance adjustments. Contractor claims extra costs. If the contractor had to spend extra money because of the unexpected event, they ask the insurance company to cover these costs. Insurance company pays out. The insurance company checks the contractor's claim and, if everything is in order, pays them for the extra costs. Project gets back on track. Finally, with all the adjustments made, the contractor updates the employer on the project status and continues with the work, aiming to complete the project despite the unexpected setback.
This sequence shows how a construction project can deal with big, unexpected problems by following a set process, ensuring that everyone involved knows what to do and that the project can move forward as smoothly as possible. When a force majeure event occurs under the conditions specified in the FIDIC Yellow Book 1999, and particularly as modified in the MDB, Multilateral Development Banks, version to accommodate design-build projects, the settlement of payments to the contractor is guided by specific clauses. Clause 19.4 outlines the conditions under which the contractor is entitled to payment due to force majeure. Here's how this clause facilitates the settlement process. Identification of force majeure events. The clause specifies that for the contractor to be entitled to payment, the force majeure event must fall within the categories described in subparagraphs I, to IV of subclause 19.1. These categories include various forms of natural disasters, war, hostilities, and other significant events beyond the control of the contractor. Location of the event. For subparagraphs E to IV of subclause 19.1, the event must occur within the country where the project is located. This specification ensures that the entitlement to payment is directly related to events that impact the project's execution within its geographical context. Entitlement to payment. If the force majeure event meets these criteria, the contractor is entitled to payment for any such cost incurred as a result. Cost, here refers to additional expenses directly attributable to the force majeure event, such as delays in work, need for additional resources, or other unforeseen expenditures necessary to overcome or mitigate the impact of the event. Notification and documentation. Upon identifying a qualifying force majeure event, the contractor must notify the employer and provide detailed documentation of the event's impact on their obligations and the associated costs. This documentation is crucial for the engineer's review and determination process. Engineer's role in determination. Subclause 3.5, Determinations, outlines the engineer's role in this process. After receiving notice from the contractor, the engineer is tasked with agreeing or determining the matters related to the force majeure event. This includes assessing the validity of the force majeure claim, the impact on the project, and the reasonableness of the costs claimed by the contractor. Settlement of payment, the engineer's determination forms the basis for the settlement of payment. If the engineer agrees with the contractor's claim, the employer is then obligated to make payment for the additional costs incurred due to the force majeure event. The determination process is meant to be fair and impartial, ensuring that the contractor is compensated for genuine additional expenses while safeguarding the employer from unjustified claims. Resolution of disputes. In cases where there is disagreement over the engineer's determination, the FIDIC Yellow Book provides mechanisms for dispute resolution. These mechanisms ensure that both parties have a fair opportunity to present their case and seek a resolution through mediation, arbitration, or other agreed-upon methods. This structured approach to handling force majeure events and the associated costs ensures that all parties have a clear framework for addressing the financial implications of such events, promoting fairness and transparency in the settlement process. The FIDIC Yellow Book 1999, including its modifications in the MDB version for design-build projects, outlines a comprehensive framework for dealing with force majeure events and their financial implications. Understanding how claims under Clause 20.1, Contractors' Claims, relate to insurance recoveries involves examining the nature of the costs incurred and the coverage provided by insurance policies. Here's how this works for events described in subclause 19.1 I-2-V, and the potential for claims under Clause 20.1 alongside recoveries from insurance companies. Claims under Clause 20.1 Scope of Clause 20.1 This clause allows the contractor to make claims for additional time and or costs due to various circumstances affecting the project, including force majeure events. The claim process requires detailed documentation and justification of how the event impacted the project and the necessity of additional time or costs, 
Events from I to V The events listed in subclause 19.1 range from natural disasters to war and civil unrest. Claims related to these events under Clause 20.1 would typically focus on extensions of time and direct costs incurred that are not covered by insurance, such as mobilization slash demobilization, increased costs due to delays, and other project-specific impacts. Insurance Recoveries Insurance coverage, projects under FIDIC contracts are required to have comprehensive insurance coverage, including, but not limited to, contractors all risk insurance, which covers physical damage to the works, plant, and materials. The scope of coverage for force majeure events would depend on the specific terms and exclusions of the insurance policy. Recoveries for events, I, to, V insurance policies may cover physical damage to the works or equipment caused by natural disasters, such as earthquakes or hurricanes, and other events. However, they may not cover all costs associated with these events, such as penalties for delays, additional operational costs not directly related to physical damage, or costs above the limits of the policy. Combining Claims and Insurance Recoveries Dual Recovery In principle, the contractor can pursue both a claim under Clause 20.1 for costs and extensions of time not covered by insurance and seek recoveries from the insurance company for covered losses. However, it is crucial to avoid double recovery for the same costs. The contractor must clearly differentiate between costs claimed from the employer under the contract and damages recovered from insurance. Contractual and Insurance Obligations the contractor needs to navigate both the contractual obligations under the FIDIC terms and the provisions of their insurance policy. This includes adhering to notification requirements, claim submission deadlines, and documentation for both processes. Subrogation rights. Insurance companies typically have subrogation rights, meaning they can pursue recovery from third parties responsible for the loss after compensating the insured. In the context of a FIDIC contract, if the insurance company pays for damages that were also compensated by the employer under a claim, the insurance company might seek recovery from the employer or another responsible party. In summary, while the contractor can pursue claims under Clause 20.1 for certain costs and also seek recoveries from insurance for covered losses, they must carefully manage these processes to ensure compliance with both contractual and insurance policy requirements, avoiding overlap in recoveries for the same costs. Claims for events I, 2, 4 under Clause 20.1 and Insurance Recovery The first part of the paragraph indicates that the contractor is entitled to claim under Clause 20.1 for events categorized under I, 2, 4 of Subclause 19.1. This entitlement includes seeking compensation for additional costs incurred due to these force majeure events, including costs for rectifying or replacing works and or goods damaged or destroyed by such events. Suppose a natural disaster, covered under category I, a natural catastrophe, strikes the project site. The contractor incurs additional costs to repair the damage and replace destroyed materials. The contractor can claim these additional costs under Clause 20.1, provided they are not already covered by insurance. Claims for events 2, 2, 4, not indemnified by insurance. The second part specifies that for events under categories 2, 2, 4, which occur within the country, the contractor can claim costs under Clause 20.1 to the extent that these costs are not indemnified by the insurance policy referred to in Subclause 18.2. If there's an act of terrorism, Category 2, in the country affecting the project, and the insurance covers only part of the damage to the works, the contractor can claim the uncovered portion under Clause 20.1. Event occurs in manufacturer's country. If a force majeure event occurs in the manufacturer's country, e.g., Japan, affecting goods intended for the project in another country, e.g., India, the implications for claims under Clause 20.1 and insurance recoveries would depend on the specific terms of the contract and insurance policy. A critical piece of equipment being manufactured in Japan is destroyed by an earthquake, a force majeure event under Category I. 
If the project's insurance policy covers such eventualities, the contractor would seek recovery through insurance. If the policy does not cover the event or only partially covers it, the contractor might then claim the additional costs under Clause 20.1. If the force majeure event falls under Categories 2, 2, 4 and occurs outside the country, India, in this case, the contractor's ability to claim under Clause 20.1 would hinge on the contract's stipulations regarding such international events. Typically, the focus is on events within the country of the project. However, if the event directly impacts the contractor's ability to deliver the project, e.g., by destroying goods intended for the works, the contractor might seek to claim these costs, arguing that they could not have reasonably anticipated or mitigated the impact of such an event. This is a table that categorizes each type of force majeure event from subclause 19.1 I to V of the Fittick Yellow Book 1999, detailing their claimability under Clause 20.1, Insurance Indemnification Status, and considering the location of the event, project country like India versus manufactured country like Japan. Key Takeaways Natural catastrophes, I, are generally claimable under Clause 20.1 and often covered by insurance, regardless of where they occur, due to their broad impact on both the project and manufactured goods. Events, 2, 2, 4, are claimable under Clause 20.1 when they occur within the project's country, reflecting their direct impact on the project's execution. However, these are less likely to be indemnified by insurance, especially when considering war, terrorism, or radioactive contamination, due to common exclusions in insurance policies. For events occurring in the manufactured country, the ability to claim under Clause 20.1 primarily depends on the direct impact those events have on the project. Insurance coverage for goods in transit or stored overseas before being shipped to the project site may vary and is subject to the terms of the insurance policy. Force majeure events are extraordinary, unforeseen occurrences that can significantly impact project timelines and costs. The Fittick Yellow Book 1999 provides a framework for addressing these events, including Clause 20.1, which outlines the conditions under which contractors can claim additional time and costs. Let's delve into how different force majeure events, categorized from I to V, are managed, whether they're claimable under Clause 20.1, and how insurance plays a role, considering the event's location, be it in the project country, India, or the manufacturing country, Japan. Event Type I – Natural Catastrophes These include earthquakes, hurricanes, and floods. For the MAHSR project, if such an event occurs in India, it could delay construction or damage infrastructure, making it claimable under Clause 20.1. Similarly, if a natural catastrophe impacts the Hitachi Kawasaki facilities in Japan, it could delay the delivery of the E5 Shinkansen trains. Both scenarios are generally covered by insurance, though specifics depend on the policy terms. Event Types 2, 2, 4, Human-Made Events This range includes war, terrorism, and radioactive contamination. If these occur in India, affecting the MAHSR project directly, the contractor can claim under Clause 20.1 for additional costs incurred. However, these events are less likely to be covered by insurance due to common exclusions for war and terrorism-related damages. If such an event impacts the manufacturing process in Japan, the direct claim under Clause 20.1 might not be straightforward unless the event directly affects the project's execution in India. Event Type V – Specific to Manufactured Goods while not explicitly listed as V, this category considers the impact of force majeure events on goods manufactured abroad, like the E5 Shinkansen trains. If a force majeure event in Japan delays or damages these trains, the project team in India can assess the impact and potentially claim additional costs under Clause 20.1, provided the insurance doesn't fully cover these damages. Insurance Considerations Insurance plays a crucial role in mitigating financial risks associated with force majeure events. It's essential to understand the coverage scope, including what's fully covered or partially covered, and the process for claiming uninsured costs under Clause 
Navigating force majeure events requires a thorough understanding of contractual rights, insurance coverage, and the specific circumstances of each event. For the MAHSR project, proactive management and clear communication between all parties, including the contractors, the Hitachi Kawasaki Consortium, and insurance providers, are key to addressing the challenges posed by such extraordinary events. And there you have it, a comprehensive dive into the world of FIDIC clauses, focusing on insurance and force majeure, all brought to life with practical examples and scenarios. We hope this session has illuminated some of the complexities of construction law and given you valuable insights that you can apply in your projects or studies. At Growth Mindset Company, our mission is to empower you with knowledge, to turn challenges into opportunities, and to foster a community that thrives on learning and growth. Your support is the cornerstone of our journey, enabling us to bring more educational content like this directly to you. So, if you found value in today's video, we kindly ask you to show your support. A simple click on the like button and subscribe to our channel can make a huge difference. It helps us reach more curious minds like yours and motivates us to continue creating content that enriches and educates. Don't forget to hit the bell icon to stay updated on our latest uploads. We have plenty more insightful content on the way, and we can't wait to share it with you. Your engagement and feedback fuel our passion and help shape the future of Growth Mindset Company. Together, let's build a community where knowledge leads to growth and success. Thank you for watching, and remember, keep nurturing that growth mindset. See you in the next video.